Go on up front. Don't be intimidated. This person. Yeah, there's like. I think that. Circle or just stay here? I think this is fine. Okay. Okay. How about everybody? Do we like move our desks into a circle or like. Um, we just like, like sit, go maybe in the first row or something. Yeah, sit in like those six steps. Yes. Close to each other. Yes, we can. Okay. Oh, one, two, three. So kind of like, do we want to move them so that we're facing each other or just stay straight? Uh, just stay straight. Okay. Actually, I'll come up and sit by dead center. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so just to just so I know, was uh, Ella Harris also in your group? Yeah, I don't so. Ella was in my group. Ella was in your group. So you guys didn't, yeah, it was just you three then. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. 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 So. So basically, this is our cool dice. Yeah, it's really big. Okay, so we're going to take turns and I'm going to give it to each of you. And you're going to try to roll it. And you want to try to not have it land on the number two. So if it doesn't land on the number two, then you get. <laughs> However many um, numbers that you roll, that's how many cards you get. And you want to get as many as you possibly can. But if you get a two, then you lose them all and you're out. So you want to get as many as you possibly can. Yeah. Can we like opt out of rolling it if we're just like, no, I'm too nervous this you time? Can. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Already so, uh, yeah, we'll start so over that side. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then you just want to pass it along. Okay. What? I'm definitely going to roll a two. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> the only <laughs> one that would be <laughs> just slightly better. All right, here we go. Oh. <laughs> I want one and one. 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 <laughs> Thank you. What? Yes, please. So one is better than two, but that's it. <laughs> if we need more pieces of paper, I can be cutting paper. Okay. Yeah. Oh, you lose all of them. Wait, what? Yeah. Out of the game. No. <laughs> Is that completely? Yeah. Oh, 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 oh my gosh. So are you. <laughs> you lost <laughs> one? Yeah. I, don't know why. I feel like sitting next to Kelly's bad luck. Yeah. Yes! <laughs> I got six. Thank you. And remember, if you feel like you've got enough and you don't want to continue, you don't want to like really try it to get as many as possible, you can opt out of rolling. I feel like Brooklyn has like 14 though, so I'm going to keep rolling. <laughs> Three. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> Oh, oh. <laughs> that was a lot, too. <laughs> Jaden has a lot, too, I feel like. Hmm. <laughs> no. Yes! <laughs> yes! <laughs> we have two players left, right?
I don't know how many she has. All right, I'm going to try. Oh. <laughs> One, two, three. Thank you. Man, four. Four. No! <laughs> I'm going for it. I'm going for it. <laughs> Every time. Woo! Chugging along. I can't lose now. You can. You can lose now. One. I stood all for a while. Oh, my yep. money. <laughs> you want to try to keep going? Hold on, I just win. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want more money, though? I feel pretty safe winning. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. I just keep rolling until I lost everything. <laughs> Gamblers. <laughs> Gambling addiction. <laughs> so the whole point of this activity was to explain and show that desire can take advantage of you. Um, yeah. this, <laughs> um, this relates to how Stanley acts um, before he thinks in these chapters. Um, he he's just, a, he's just a little crazy and he just does things um, and then he instantly wants forgiveness from Stella and um, he feels like he has the power to do so because he is a man. Um, and Blanche also acts for herself and doesn't think about how her actions affect other people. And um, she's like really selfish. And in the end, she loses Mitch from lying and Stanley loses Stella. And so the whole part of this is that if you want something, um, don't take advantage of it. Desire Don't pursue it unquestioningly because mm -hmm. at the end of the day you might lose it all just yeah. because of that. Or you pursuit. might win. Or you might no. win. Yeah. I think that's not how it works. But like the majority of people lose. There's only a few winners. Mm -hmm. All right. All yeah. right. We were going to bring you guys candy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the paper works. Okay, that's it for the activity then? Yeah. Okay, cool. Let's um then just you can sit where you want now. Because I want to point us to some passages that I think um, speak to speak to what they were talking about in their activity. So um, everybody turn to page 53 of your books. And then we'll get into our discussion. Yes, yeah. Or you want me just to share it with you? Either way. So you're going to turn to page 53 because this group was talking about um, how desire, like kind of unquestioningly pursuing your desire is going to lead to this kind of like idea of the majority of people losing, right? Because if you just keep taking chances with your desire, then eventually you're going to get a bad one <laughs> and uh, it's going to break you in some way. Um, you're going to lose everything. And they, they were talking about how then like Stanley acts before he thinks um, that he's like, he sort of is impulsive then and acting out all of these desires all the time. But I want to think about if that actually like, who wins when they act out their desire and who loses when they act out to their desire? Because I don't know that that is evenly spread across the characters and across the different demographics that we were talking about last time. So if you look on page 53, this is when um, Stella and Blanche are talking about who maybe will get ahead in the world. And they're talking about Mitch at first. And uh, so this starts on 52. And Blanche says, I thought he had a sort of sensitive look. And Stella says, his mother is sick. 
And Blanche says, is he married? And Stella's like, no, is he a wolf? Why Blanche, I don't think he would be. And Stella's like laughing at that idea of um, Mitch being a wolf. A wolf is kind of like Stanley, right? They, like this group was talking about, somebody who just like sort of unquestionably pursues their desires, goes after what they want, animal instincts, you know? And here's Stella saying like, no, of course he's, I mean, look at him. He's not a wolf, you know? Um, and Blanche says, what does he, what does he do? And Stella says he's on the precision bench in the spare parts department at the plant Stanley travels for. And Blanche asks, is that something much? And she doesn't know anything about factory work, right? Teachers, just a reminder, if you are on the first floor and if you have juniors in, you, in your class, you need to excuse them to the auditorium immediately. Thank you. Uh, oh, college day. Yeah. Yeah, but you're gonna go at I think eight thirty. Yeah. Um, okay, so she doesn't know anything about factory, which she has to ask. And Sella says, "No, Stanley's the only one of his crowd that's likely to get anywhere." And Blanche says, "What makes you think Stanley will?" Stella says, "Look at him." Blanche says, "I've looked at him. Like <laughs> I don't understand what it's supposed to mean." Stella says, "Then you should know." And Blanche says, I'm sorry, but I haven't noticed the stamp of genius even on Stanley's forehead. What does that little phrase mean, the stamp of genius? Like, what is Blanche sort of assuming about getting ahead in the world there? Yeah, it's like it's cleverness, you know, it's like intelligence. And here, she has talked many times in this play about Stanley's Neanderthal sort of nature and like his brow, especially like that's one thing that um, <clears throat> we that some people will retain, you know, when you take those ancestry.com like DNA tests and some people will have Neanderthal blood. Have you heard about that? Yeah. Like a tiny percent of Neanderthal DNA. I don't know. Um, Neanderthal like genetics will be in there. I don't know how they, they could tell that or whatever, but um, that oftentimes gets associated with the brow line. Uh, my husband has a Neanderthal brow, actually, <laughs> which I think is really funny to tease him about. But it kind of like sticks out kind of further, right? And it's like this sign of like, not just um, unintelligence then, because it's associated with cavemen, but also like brute strength and force. And this big speech she gives about how Stanley is one of the beasts, it's kind of that idea. So she's like, it's important that she says, even on Stanley's for it, I haven't noticed the stamp of, of genius here. Um, and then she's, she's un, in the process of undressing. And she says, it isn't on his forehead and it isn't genius. And Blanche says, oh, well, what is it and where? I would like to know. And Stella says, it's a drive that he has. You're standing in the light, Blanche. So what, what does that tell us about like the way that Stella then is interpreting getting ahead in the world? Yeah. But it is a kind of ambition then, right? Like if you are not going to sit back and think about all of the different sort of um, scenarios that might come your way and like worry basically, if you're not like anxious about like acting out that, and you just act on impulse, then Stella's interpreting that like, he's gonna get ahead, like at his company, he's gonna get ahead in um, like in the world because of this sort of quality that he has. And do you think that Stella then is being like naive there? Um, is she be is she wrapped up in her own desires and making decisions unquestionably based on her desires, or do you think that she's kind of right in this play? Is Stanley going to get ahead because he's the type of person who acts out the way that he does, or is that going to is his lack of genius going to hold him back? His refinement going to hold him back? Yeah, I think it really depends on what crowd he involves himself with. Mm -hmm. You know, if he's in a very professional sphere, then I don't think he's going to get very far. Right. But if it's something much more, I don't know, where you would need to demonstrate some degree of strength and drive to actually get ahead, then I think 
he'd be great. Yeah, and he is in this world that we were talking about when we talked about setting. He's in this kind of New Orleans working class world, right? And so, yeah, you're right. He's not going to be CEO of the company. Maybe, actually, you know, the more I think about it, maybe CEOs fit with that, <laughs> that type as well. He's not going to be a refined kind of like civil rights attorney, though, you know, like he's not going to get far in these kind of intellectual fields. But in the field that he is in, and we, in terms of like the setting and the community that he is in, by the end of this book, it is Stanley who ends up up on top. Stanley is the Jaden of the, of the group, just rolling that dice over and over again, and always getting more and more money because she's taking those risks, right? And you kind of imagine that if Stanley were to roll the two and all of the money to be taken from him, he would just demand to have that dice back again. You know, he would walk up to you guys and take it out of your hands and keep rolling it, right? Um, so there's like, there's this kind of like pessimism in that too, the, that um, he is able to act on desires and still come out ahead. Ali Rose, were you gonna say something? Um, I was gonna say like, uh, um, he, I think he's both like being naive and also like really smart about it. Because I don't think Stanley, Stanley's not a stupid person. Mm. He understands exactly what he's doing. He understands exactly how to manipulate people. He is very, he knows like how to work with great things like uh -huh. uh -huh. So I think it's like naive of him to think that he's a rat who can go awfully far. But he's exactly the type of person who goes awfully far and like knows how to do things to get for him. Yeah, so maybe it's kind of naive of her to think about where she'll fit into that, mm -hmm. into that scenario too. So let's talk about then why Stanley gets to be that person. Um, because I think you guys, your theme is right for basically everyone but Stanley, right? So why, what is it about Stanley that makes him the type of person that can keep acting on desires and keep like winning because of it? The way I said that. Um, felt a little political to me. There are some people, right, that act on desires um, and do nasty things and say nasty things and end up on top, you know? Um, <laughs> Trump. All right, let's go to page 24. I keep getting in trouble for saying my political class, so I feel like if you're if you're offended, come talk to me personally. Don't tell your mom. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. Okay. So on page 24, Stanley is introduced. And his introduction, this is kind of one of those moments like in this setting where we're like, are we supposed to be reading this as a director or an actor? Or is this like actually a reading experience like it is a novel? Because the way that, that Tennessee Williams describes it is really important. So look at the bottom of 24. It says, more laughter and shouts of parting come from the men. Stanley throws the screen door of the kitchen open and comes in. He's a medium height, about five feet, eight or nine, and strongly compactly built. Animal joy in his being is implicit in all his movements and attitudes. Since earliest manhood, the center of his life has been pleasure with women, the giving and taking of it, not with weak indulgence dependently, but with the power and pride of a richly feathered male bird among hens. Branching out from this complete and satisfying center are all the auxiliary channels of his life, such as his hardiness with men, his appreciation of rough humor, his love of good drink and food and games, his car, his radio, everything that is his, that bears his emblem of the gaudy seed bearer. He sizes women up at a glance with sexual classifications, crude images flashing into his mind and determining the way he smiles at them. Remember when I said, when you read the play, you hate Stanley so much more than when he's first introduced in the movie. Um, I think this is this is part of it. Like without the sort of Marlon Brando exterior, this is the interior of Stanley and it is very unappealing, but it's also kind of the source of his success in this kind of a world, this broken world that we've been talking about. Yeah. I think the way he says, like it says he views himself as like a um, rich feathered male bird among him. It almost he like he um, knows that he's admired and he um, is treating himself kind of like a VIP, like it's a privilege for other women to be around him, and he's like it's kind of like almost like condescending, he's yeah giving them a chance or something. Like, so that's yeah. I think why it's 
um, is able to hold so much control over Stella because he's like, I'm making, I'm giving my time to you. I, I don't have to do this, but I choose to, and so that makes her feel like Absolutely. Absolutely. It kind of goes back to that Byronic hero type character where it's like the bad boy type character that selects you out of the crowd. And so you feel like, well, this guy's hard to please. So it's amazing that I'm the one who can do that, you know? Um, the, and the richly feathered thing comes up constantly. Stanley is always wearing bright, gaudy colors. When it talks about the poker scene in scene three, it says all the men sitting around the table wear colored shirts, solid blue, a purple, a red and white check, a light green. They are men at the peak of their physical manhood, as coarse and direct and powerful as the primary color. So this idea then that not just Stanley can do that, but all men can do that. <laughs> all men can kind of come into the room and be the loudest, brightest one there. And that Blanche wears her frills and her kind of like in the dark kind of um, muted colors. And that's the kind of game she has to play. Daylin? Um, I feel like Stanley's people are kind of afraid of him in a way. Mm -hmm. like, um, they're scared to compete with him because they know how he can be violent. And I feel like that has to do with like like proving to the game in a way because you are afraid to lose against the other players. Yeah. Know? Yeah. So like I don't know, I, I feel like people keep like the other people in the trip in the story keep trying to get what they want but they keep losing because they keep losing so yeah i mean you look here um he, it says he doesn't take it with a weak indulgent but with the power and pride of a richly feathered male bird and so it kind of goes to like the animalistic quality of competition um that it's part of it's not just that he then has this sort of like innate identity of being powerful um, and, and everybody else, it's a privilege to be around him, but it's, it's a display, you know, uh, you guys watch like planet earth or whatever, and you watch the birds dancing around each other and showing each other their plumage, right? The male bird shows the woman, the plumage to try to like get with her. <laughs> um, it's male peacocks that have all of the feathers and the females can just be sort of like drab and, and hanging out because the males have to impress the women, right? So there's a kind of performance here and there's this idea that Stanley wins the performance. So it's almost like um, an accomplishment then. And so that kind of confidence is going to allow him then to take as many chances as he wants because he knows he's already won one important contest. What about this idea of having a branching out from this complete and satisfying center. What does that mean that he has a complete and satisfying center? Yeah. Okay, good. Tell me about fulfillment. What does it mean to be fulfilled? So, so what's interesting there is that like the word fulfillment means like a lack of desire, right? you have everything that you want. And that doesn't quite seem to be Stanley. Like Stanley does seem to always want more. Um, so maybe that's the branching out from this complete and satisfying center or all the auxiliary channels of his life. Maybe like um, that's a kind of auxiliary channel to his life, right? But it's important that at the center of him, he feels complete. Uh -huh. I think in a way it's meant to kind of be the emphasis of what Blanche is, mm -hmm. right? Because Stanley obviously wants all this other stuff, but as for he himself, like he he doesn't really want anything else, uh, you know, about his intrinsic being. He's perfectly happy with what he is as a person. Yeah. Whereas someone like Blanche would be, you know, an individual who is able to attain a lot in terms of other people's perception of her and everything, like kind of the outward auxiliary, but isn't satisfied with what she actually is. It always tries to deceive others into this kind of self-image that she wants to attain. Absolutely, beautifully put, right? So it's like this idea that Stanley is, um, Stanley is not broken then, the way that Blanche might be broken. Blanche is always the auxiliary for other people, but she doesn't have her own kind of identity to sort of center around. Whereas Stanley sees that his identity is complete. So you think back to Doral from As I Lay Dying and how he was like in this process of breaking up his identity and not fully understanding how it all worked together. Um, he's like, well, sometimes I'm conscious and sometimes I'm unconscious and I don't know if that's the same person. Stanley does not have those concerns. Stanley is always the same person. He is an integrated whole. He's like, everything about my personality fits 
within this identity that I have. And I have no questions about why I behave the way I behave sometimes. Blanche, on the other hand, is a different person depending on every single scenario that she is in because she's here trying to please all these other people, you know, to be their auxiliary. Um, so she, here she is like, I'm going to be this flirtatious kind of like um, mm, challenging woman to Stanley. I'm going to be the protective big sister with Stella. I'm going to be the weak kind of um, feminine girl with Mitch. And I need to be all of these different people. And at back home, I'm going to be teacher who gets with the student, you know, like uh, uh, somebody who like acts out on desires kind of the same way that Stanley does. Um, but that's always a different person. So we could never say she has this complete satisfying center. Mm -hmm. I think it's significant that it says it's satisfying center mm -hmm. instead of satisfied because that gives the impression that he's not finished um, yeah. with what he wants and that it's a constant thing. Um, he's always um, driven to achieve that, like that satisfaction. And it's like I, um, and I think that's when he gets really, really angry is when like he isn't able to do that. Um, yeah. So he uses that anger to try and like show his satisfaction. So it's like it's this fact that it's always like this cycle. He's always trying to um, like prove that he's better or show that he's in charge yes it's not like that he's he's desperately reaching out to like fulfill some sort of like hole within himself right but it's him um angry when what he sees it what he understands is like a superior self yeah like when blanche when she kind of breaks that routine by suggesting that like maybe he's being Stella. Right, right. And you kind of get the feeling that everybody in this community is in that same routine and upholds that same power structure kind of seamlessly. Allie Rose? Um, well, like, I think there's a very simple expression, but it's something like here. Um, first, like, to tear his elbow and bone of the body together, like, happening that time to his yeah. sexual desire. Yeah. And then the fact that Blanche introduces herself instead of Stanley first. Well, like, interesting. Basically, the guy introduces himself first, and him just staring at her is so incredibly rude and, like, not even, like, trying to insist. Uh -huh. like, like, that, it, it, it just shows how, um, and, like, him staring at her and not introducing himself or anything, I think that, like, shows how. He doesn't see anyone as a person, mm -hmm. not even Stella. He sees them as potential like lovers, potential yeah. like people who will support him. They're not people, they're objects. Every single one, every single thing is his work. Yes. Yes, I think absolutely. And that kind of leads into this. I mean, that definitely leads into this concept that I want to talk about. What's the symbol for men? Is it this one? Is that one? It's the circle and down. Or is it an arrow and something? So it's the plus, it's the plus sign and down. Yeah, yeah. So it's circle plus sign. I've done that. So that's the symbol for female. No, the wait. Oh, oh like the male arrow. is the sideways, right? The male's the arrow. This one is male? Yeah. 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 I don't remember. Okay, male. Nail. There we go. Over here, we've got female. Okay, it could be any of the other women in the story. And it seems like what Allie Rose is saying is that it's like the female is holding up this mirror. Right? And the mirror, so that instead of Stanley looking at the female and recognizing the female, right, and saying, you are also a person, but it's also a circle here, right? You are also this whole, whole complete person with an identity, and I should probably treat you the same way I might treat myself um, as a person with human dignity, right? Instead, he, here he is looking at the mirror, and the mirror is just reflecting back on himself. So the woman is the person who gets to hold up the mirror for the, for the male, and the male gets to say, wow, because I am looking at you, I get to recognize that I'm a male. 
Does that make sense a little bit? So it's kind of this idea, and this is like a gender theory idea. It's this idea that men, because, you know, because they don't have to question their identity as much, um, and they don't have to live their identity in, in um, sort of like uh, coordination with the women, that they can just sit, look at the woman as somebody who props them up in their own sort of masculine power. But what happens is here, the woman is looking at the back of the mirror. Right, and so the mirror, the woman can kind of peek around the mirror and look at the man and kind of admire the man. Um, that she could sort of look in the mirror and see what's reflected back at the man, but the woman then doesn't have a way to sort of establish her own identity except for in in sort of um, subordination to that man. So what happens then, and I think this is so interesting in, in gender theory, is that. The man really, when he has desire for the woman in this case, what he's really showing is that he has desire for himself. <laughs> I'm just talking about Stanley here. I'm not talking about every other relationship. It's the very like traditional view of gender, right? But the man too sort of looks in the mirror and he's like, wow, men are awesome. Men are really powerful. I like men, right? And the reason that he get, likes the woman is because she holds up the mirror, not necessarily because she's the woman. And you think about the way that um, gender is valued in our society, right? Like being a leader is universally a cool thing, you know? Being assertive is universally a good thing. When we talk about women joining the workplace, um, we talk about how they need to become more assertive because they're gonna get interrupted too much or they're going to say, I'm sorry, too much in emails or put too many exclamation points and smiley faces in emails, right? And we say, no, you need to be, you need to take on more of these masculine qualities in order to be seen as a competent person in this world, right? And even women oftentimes will say things like, I'm not like other girls, I'm not girly like other girls, you know, I'm not weak like other girls because femininity is associated with weakness so in this system everyone loves masculinity and everyone sort of ignores or puts aside femininity so even that women who are like i'm not holding up this mirror I'm, i refuse to do it they're just going to try to become more masculine rather than like sort of embracing the feminine you know like why shouldn't we should all put exclamation points in emails it makes people feel better <laughs> we should all say like i was wondering if you could do this for me because that kind of polite language usually gets good results you know um but instead we're like no we need to do things more the male way because that's the way that's successful not necessarily because that's really the way that's successful but because of this sort of like this sort of a system right um <laughs> So in this book, I just want to point out one more spot before then we do discussion just to kind of prove this idea. The men love each other. They, they are so supportive. They're so nice to each other. Um, they, have, they have fun with each other. Yes, they like razz each other. They're still masculine, right? And they're still like, oh, you suck at poker, blah, blah, blah. But when, when um, Stanley acts out, they gather around him, they help him out, they literally hold him upright, they put him in the shower, like they are taking care of him. And the men all kind of do this together. Um, I need to find the spot though. It's scene, it's scene three. Okay, yeah, go to page 64. So you would think in a scenario, where a man who is very muscular and, uh, and angry and drunk hits his wife who is pregnant in a weakened state, right? That everyone in that room should gather around Blanche <laughs> and should say to Blanche, like, are you okay? We're gonna get you out of this situation. We are not Blanche, sorry, Stella. Um, we're gonna get you out of this situation. We're gonna help you. Let's make sure the baby's okay, et cetera, et cetera. Like that's the person who is deserving the pity and the help right now. But all of these men uh, let Blanche and Stella leave the room. And then Mitch says, you just blew your top, Stan. Like you're, you're fine. Pablo says, oh, he's okay now. Steve says, sure, my boy's okay. Put him on the bed and get a wet towel. I think coffee would do him a world of good now. Stanley says, I want water. Mitch says, put him under the shower. They, they get him all wet <laughs> um you saw that in the movie and then it says let go of me you sons of bitches and he's he's mad and then and then they all they all leave they're kind of like oh you're you're you know too volatile but as mitch is leaving he says poker should not be played in a house with women so if men really do love women if women are the one if they really do desire women for being women um 
they sure don't act like it in this scene. It seems like they are far more committed to men than they are to the women in the scene. Okay, am I way off base? What do you think? Yeah. I think um, we can see a lot with um, Mitch and how he kind of, he wants to go talk to Clint and like how Sam is always like yelling at him to come back. And how in this scene, like he um, keeps like kind of going back and forth, like mm -hmm. he's um, starting to kind of question like, um, leaving his role, like as a man, is he supposed to be like compassionate to the women, or is he supposed to like help Stanley, um, like come to himself and stuff? And he yeah. Just, like goes and he's trying to help Blanche, like, um, and she's like, I want my sister's clothes. We have to go to the queen upstairs, and he's like, Where's the clothes? Yeah. I'm trying to help her, but then he goes back to Stanley and he's kind of just asking him back. He's got these, he's, he doesn't get to be a complete satisfying whole because he doesn't fully commit to this view of masculinity, right? Like he has some more like um, maybe effeminate traits, maybe just like chivalrous traits, but he is like really wanting to like, he has these split loyalties that are tearing him apart. And at the end of this play, Mitch is very deeply unhappy because of the way those two things have torn him apart. I hate Mitch, it's just my personal. My personal beef with Mitch. Yeah, I'll hear those. I think um, the fact that like Stella and Lance are obviously the ones who need the help, but I want to um, that's not all of them still still need them to be the ones who help. I want to see um all of them because even though it's it, it's because they're only like little sisters, yeah, it seems that they all yeah that's the phrase for it right it's it's the boys it's rose before homes right like it's it's uh these are my boys these are who i protect yeah my boy cheated on his girlfriend but and, but of course i'm gonna side with my boy because he's my boy you know like there's there's this idea of friendship above above everything else and you might think of it that way it's just friendship you know like you you value your friends because romances come and go it's you know the fleeting trace of love or the visionary trace of love you know um but it's also telling that the genders are split in that way too. You don't necessarily, yeah, it's bros, right? It's my boys and that's what's important here. And girls, I mean, girls have their own sort of allegiances too. It's just that the boys' allegiances are on display here a little bit more, yeah. Kind of a side note, this reminds me of like that scene in The Little Rascals when it shows, well, <laughs> obviously not as like awful. Hopefully not. <laughs> When the boys are like in their clubhouse and they're like talking about like girls are so awful except they're like boosting each other up like yeah we're better and all this stuff and then it shows the girls and they're just like boys are dumb and I don't yeah know, just like right and that they have to like they kind of are like pumping each other up hyping each other up to maintain these roles a little bit where it's like if you really do love each other if if heterosexuality is the norm and it is supposed to be what we are all reaching for right then doesn't this system not quite make a lot of sense you know and this is this system too is i think where blanche gets into real trouble with her with her um dead husband um where she believes that she's supposed to be this person holding up the mirror for masculinity, right? And when somebody looks in that mirror and uh, does not see her holding it, does not even acknowledge that there's a woman behind the mirror, but instead stays fully to this side, it suggests that she is no longer important in any way. She doesn't get to be sort of her own person and sort of, you know, then go over here without the mirror and love her teaching life or anything like that. No, she's desperately just now going up to every single guy and saying, look at yourself in the mirror, look at yourself in the mirror, don't you like that, don't you like that I'm holding the mirror, you know? Yeah. I do also think that it might be, you know, with respect to Blanche in particular, that this whole system is almost, in a way, kind of moved on for her, just mm. because, like, I guess what we've seen with respect to her husband thus far, you know, he was much more the sensitive type, he wrote poetry, mm -hmm. you know, things like that. I would imagine that their relationship wouldn't, you know, just presuming wouldn't quite fit with the system yes and then so now with respect to stanley she's kind of forced to engage in this whole new kind of iteration of romance which isn't really something she's ever you know and, and not that her and stanley are engaging in that in particular but it's kind of like the same she kind of is though a little bit yeah. yeah yeah she kind of is for kind of her way to get power yeah you know 
Yes, I think you're absolutely right because if you looked, um, if, whew, where was I going to say? When you look at, I lost that, but I think you're right. Anyway, the way that she, the way that she is like pretty disgusted by Stella's behavior, and Stella seems to be perfectly happy in that situation. You know, um, perfectly happy might not be the right word, but she gains something from that situation. And Blanche wants to reject that so fully. Oh, this is what I was going to say. When she talks about Mitch, she says, he's sensitive, isn't he? And that's sort of the draw then for Mitch, is that um, I still think that she can hold this up. She can say, carry me, Mitch, you know, and, and you can display your masculinity. Um, but it's not as threatening of an image, maybe. Coming back. Okay, yes, and really, and then to Allie Rose. Yeah. Uh, when Mira Oliver is being kind of broken to me, or like she's holding up like a shard of it, like the men can very much like see her personality and kind of take this of it. Yeah. But like when they're looking at her and they're like trying to be like masculine and push of it, it's like she's showing off like their broken parts as well. Because like with Stanley, she was like showing him that he's abusive and that he's stupid and that he can't get everything that he wants and he hated that. Yes. And, like with Mitch, you're just showing him that he's like lonely and sad and he really needs a like woman to like complete him. Like he was trying to get that from his mom kind of thing. But yes. he's dying and like she can't give that to him. So she's like kind of broken up. What is it about Blanche that makes people see their weaknesses when they look when they look at Blanche? I, I'm going to say what I think, and, and we'll talk about it later, but I think it's the over-the-top performative quality. I don't think she's good at performing. Um, I think that she always seems so fake that people can kind of see through and see the way that Stanley says it's swindled. Like they can see the way they're being swindled, but they can still see themselves falling for the swindle too, as if they can't help themselves. So it creates this kind of self-hatred, I think. Allie Rose? Um. Like, I think that she is trying to be all these things, but she really threw up when she was in her speech. But she didn't, like, it was not her fault that Mitch was like, that was Mitch's mistake. But, but she does say, You disgust me. Yeah, she, yeah. she did what Mitch was doing. Mm -hmm. And she really, she just was like, I can't do this. And I think that she's trying to achieve something better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and maybe she doesn't want so much a tether to reality as she wants a tether to fantasy and she wants that fantasy to be made real. Um, because the one time that she actually did express real emotion is when she says to her husband, you disgust me, right? Did you guys pick up on what happened there that she found her husband with another man? Um, they went to this dance and that's when she says, you disgust me. And he goes out and kills himself. So it feels like when she is being real, like that was her real emotion there. Um, you know, the whole system falls apart. If she could have just pretended it didn't happen, they could have stayed married in this heteronormative relationship and been been okay. Um, I'm going to break my notes down here. I mean, I just think, um, like with her reaction with Mitch, like when he finds out the worst um, stuff about her, and she's just trying to like pretend it doesn't matter that's not happening. She wants someone to like. She knows, I think deep down, like that that is not real. But she um, is kind of that attitude, like. Well, real life kind of sucks. So mm -hmm. she's looking for someone to like agree to live in this fantasy with her. Not really to that that to bring her out of it, but to um, because there's someone else and it's not just her saying this is this is who I am, this is I'm pretty, I'm like loved and all this stuff. If it's not just her saying that, if it's if there's another person in the picture, it brings like a sense of yeah, 
Um, maybe she just really wants the male here to hold up a mirror so that she can see herself reflected back in it and she can see how real she is for herself. Yeah, I mean, Stella Bl straight up asks her, Blanche, do you want him? Because she's so obsessed with, I want Mitch to like me, right? And Stella's like, well, do you like him? And she goes, I want to rest. So it's like this exhausting performance of like not knowing what's real and what's not. She wants to stop that. Yeah, yeah. I also think kind of going along with that when ever Mitch like really confronts her about lying like at first she attempts to maintain that presentation but then eventually goes into her whole like monologue about okay fine you know you want to see yeah. what I, who I really am and everything I'm a spider exactly yeah and you know this kind of goes more along with the film um but I do did notice that whenever she actually went into that monologue like her entire voice changed she was no longer like a the dainty little um, I guess like southern, almost princess type yeah. is what you say. But I actually recalling her voice, it almost sounded like Ursula from The Little Mermaid. You know, it totally like, does. She's like, I'm a spider. Exactly, like it's like very an low. Old woman type yeah. Thing. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I just think that whenever that appearance is truly threatened, she kind of almost abandons it. And uh I guess in a way, almost attempts to free herself from that whole ordeal mm -hmm. and kind of express the way she truly feels. But then, you know, eventually with the reactions of other people, she kind of reverts back to that performance. Yeah, and maybe this is what is driving her crazy there at the end because you see both in that last scene where she's making those like guttural sounds as they're like pinning her down. Like, do you remember that? That seems so uncomfortable, but it's like these deep breaths. And then suddenly she's like, oh, doctor, I've always depended on the kindness of strangers. Like when you get those changes back and forth so quickly, we see how that's kind of breaking her apart then. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to have, you know, we've been having our discussion, but I want to practice our discussion where you guys are now leading it with different kind of guiding questions. We've been talking a lot um, about this kind of gender dynamic. We can continue that. Um, pull out a piece of paper and write down, if you need paper, I've got it. Um, I want you to write again, three guiding questions. Let's do, yeah, let's do three this time. Three guiding questions that you might be able to um, discuss in our in our circle. Yes. Yeah, if you have a piece of muscle in our Did you need the real? You can definitely use the paper from last time. Um, so yeah, this time Three more guiding questions. You can still use the ones from last time in our discussion. We don't need to be done with those, um, but let's get three more that are really focused on scenes three through six. So this is uh, the date with Mitch, the abuse, and then the conversation after that was, it was the, the a poker game and abuse, the conversation afterwards with Blanche and Stella, and then the date with Mitch. Okay, so now you have your three guiding questions. I want you to find two passages that connect to two of those questions. So two passages from the play that um, you think speak to the answers of those questions that you have. Here we go. Okay, um, so this time I'd like to be a little bit more silent. And what I'm hoping is that you guys can build off each other's questions. So when you feel like we've discussed the question enough, or when you feel like the question that someone else asked leads you to your passage, um, try to try to um, direct us all there. If there's a real role in the conversation, I might step in. I'm definitely going to offer my opinions because I can't help it. But um, you guys are going to direct this this time. Okay. So who wants to start us off? Got a good opening question for this. Go ahead. Um, I can find a quote for it, but um, shown by Daniel and Blanche, what are the correlations or the similarities between regret and selfishness? Tell us what, what you were thinking about. Okay. 
this would affect um, deep down like the point where you get it like from a sense of selfishness or a honest desire for change. Okay. Yeah. And I do think that in the book in particular, pretty much everyone who does display a substantial degree of regret is because they weren't able to attain something that they themselves desired. Um, it's not really like, oh, I wish I was nicer to this individual, or oh, I, I really wish that something that I said or did be retracted because that hurt somebody. Uh, even in the case of Blanche with respect to her husband, it's kind of more, you know, like I was left in a horrible, destitute situation because my husband decided to, you know, go and kill himself. You know, why would he do that? And there is certainly some regret, like, I'm sure she feels sorry for what happened, but it's less about you know him and what you know, how that and everything she said kind of impacted his well-being and rather how his actions impacted hers. Would you mind elaborating more? No, notes. I'm not. You want to take notes when people are inspiring you to think about the play in a different way, so that you have something to write about. You're stealing each other's ideas. I really like what you said about um, regret coming from like a lack of something. So it's not always like I feel so horrible because I did this to someone. While they might act that way, like Stanley apologizing to Stella over and over again, um, he is more just sad and worried that he'll lose that connection with her and what they had, and he's just desperately trying. And I suppose kind of going, you know, that this is kind of a poor segue, but um, going along with like Stella and Stanley's relationship, especially, uh, one of the questions that I asked would be, are gender power um, imbalances universal or in the form expressed in the novel, like personally unique and or dependent on culture and qualities, things like that is, you know, this kind of something that we see in almost every culture or is it, you know, more just some defect or quality associated with certain time periods, certain places, etc. I think in that sense, the play is a little bit pessimistic because um, it kind of shows it as an inevitable thing, like um, that there's always going to be these imbalances that the search for comfort is what really leads people to um, stay in relationships, I guess, which isn't necessarily like, I don't think it's universal, but like the play kind of shows it as like this thing that's like underlying, like even though Mitch seems like this person at first, and like this very chivalrous, like he um, in the end is like, I don't know, um, ended up being almost a little toxic, like with how he was treating Blanche. Um, the underlying sense that, like, this is me because you want me. I wonder if the play Boldy thinks the gender imbalance is uh, wrong and something that needs to be rectified, too. I do think it is kind of interesting that. Really, the only person who I can think of in the play who would have kind of circumvented that whole issue uh, would, you know, just off the top of my head, be Blanche's former husband. And yet, it's almost like the play is saying that because that whole, I guess, relationship didn't actually accord with this common standard, that 
you know, it, it inevitably led to his death and kind of his removal from the entire system. And, and that was partially a result of Blanche herself kind of rejecting that whole idea. I mean, sure, she was someone who enjoyed his sympathy and kind of that he didn't accord with this whole construal of how relationships are being to be formed. But, you know, at the end of the day, it was kind of her, I guess, rejection of that lack of consistency that's, you know, even, even though she would be the one who's actually kind of bearing the burden of the whole mm -hmm. system, it's, you know, she's still, in a way, fostering it mm -hmm. herself. So it's kind of like the question is sort of like, is Stella enabling family abuse, right? And is Stella, is that enabling a performance that she's doing to make sure that Stella stays? Or is this, you know, her, her authentic self, I guess, is enabling? I got kind of a question, right? Is Stella, is Stella just like treating Stanley like in the way that he wants to be treated? Well, kind of like, like certain things she does annoy him, like makes him tick. Mm -hmm. And she knows that. Mm. And so my question is, do you think she's doing that on purpose? I so see. So can feel powerless. I see. So it's like enabling him to not, not, like she's egging him on. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you comment on kind of the toxic chemistry? And she might not believe that it's toxic, but by revolting against Christianity a little bit, and um, it kind of brings that, I don't, I don't know, like that fire, I guess, into the relationship, like to keep things interesting. Like she doesn't, like, I mean, she wants to be happy, but um, she doesn't think that it's his personality to be just like peaceful and agreeing all the time. And I think she's trying to um, get him to like be more drawn to her um, through like kind of the like funky attitude and like <laughs> um, almost entertaining. Did anyone find like a passage that relates to this question? Okay. Yeah, I believe that Stella kind of trains Stella. Like the kind of main character of the book is trying to get her to But also after um they had the fight and they broke up, she felt like she was so hard to deal with. And she says that um I just never feel like until you guys are at like the water scene, like the point of deciding all the negative things that you did to impress her to the point that they killed the sheriff and the police and all that stuff to like piss him off, but yet his reaction is like the hard part to deal with the situation. Yeah, that's on page 73. Mm -hmm. Y'all look into that. Let's let's do some close reading of that like little passage. So when you guys were annotating, what did you put in this little section? I think it's really interesting that um, 
shows like her insecurities, um, especially with like inviting or with family, first of all, like because it's such a uh, change from how she and Blanche grew up and she tells Blanche that. Um, and so I think she knows like as she, she's getting ready to have a baby that it's kind of selfish to stay in this situation, but um, she's trying to, she's constantly trying to make herself feel better about it. I think that's part of why she invites or lets Blanche in because Blanche is kind of a reminder of her former life, I guess, and um, the person that she was before she met Stanley and like I guess inspire her as a better mom. Um, and if she can get Blanche to like accept and be okay with how she's living now, then maybe it's kind of like a reconciliation that she can accept it and that maybe it's not like as dangerous. Mm -hmm. I'm going off of what you were saying. Um, I definitely do think she's selfish, but she, I feel like she's kind of trying to justify it because on some of the she's just like talking about how it isn't right for anyone to make such a ter terrible growth that people do sometimes. So to me, that kind of shows that she definitely does recognize that she's in an unsafe situation. And it would be in her best interest and for her child to kind of get out of it, but she's selfish. I see like the feel of the relationship. So. Are we kind of victim blaming right now, though, Stella? Like, is this problematic the way that we're talking about her being selfish by doing? I do think that, I mean, there is obviously that concern with respect to any conversation of this nature, but I do also think that acknowledging like everything that perpetuates uh, domestic violence in this situation or in uh, Stanley's relationship is the best way to, I don't know, uh, like, I guess, understand it and find a way that it can be rectified. Um, because I, I did put on that particular page where she was talking Blanche, you know, that justification and a love for otherwise aversive qualities perpetuates domestic violence. And so I do think that acknowledging the role that even Stella herself plays in this situation is, and being cognizant of that is kind of something that is required almost if, you know, the whole issue is to be potentially overcome. 
Well, it's interesting to hear how Blanche kind of um, gets into the same mode of talking about Bella, like at the, at the bottom of 72, where she says, and you, you let him, you didn't run, you didn't scream, as though it is Stella's responsibility to be the one who kind of um, controls Stanley's behavior. So it goes back to Dale's question too about like, is Stella like egging him on? Does, and Blanche certainly, does Blanche think that? Does everybody else think that? And then does Tennessee Williams think that? Like does Tennessee Williams think, oh, Stella is partly to blame in this situation or does he think that she's some victim of, uh, a complex system of gender, and I think it's both, probably, right? Like, that's what Sam was saying. Let's see what we're looking at. Yeah, I think it kind of shows the skill set for people in the complex gender and stuff, and like how it'll like almost feel like inevitable, like, um, like, uh, meanness. I don't know how to say it. Mm -hmm. Everything like turns up scared. Like, she is constantly making a threat. She could have fallen apart. Like she even says that to Stan when he's yelling at Stella. She's like, I'm going to fall apart. And she never, ever does. And like, it never shows a reason for not doing that. Same with Stella. Like, she never says, like, I'm saying Stan is because of this. It's just like, this is just what happened. Mm -hmm. Like she, she's a little, she's kind of immature or like saying her things. Um, because she was long in for something that was fair. And But it's like she doesn't recognize like the reality of the situation. Like she might be living in this much of a fantasy world with Glenn and Glenn still young. Is that like when you said like she's immature about the situation? Is that sort of what you mean? Um, um, oh, that's okay. That happens. <laughs> it happened to me today. <laughs> um, and I feel like she she's really like jealousy of her and um, she. Isn't thinking about the future and like her kid's future and uh, like she just needs to grow up and like take control of her life and then like Ben is kind of cute. It's interesting that idea of her being immature because when we see her at the beginning of the scene, she's reading comic books. Um, which is, you know, supposed to be for kids, especially in the 40s, but it would have been for kids, you know? So here she is on the bus reading comic books, and of course her eyes and lips have that almost narcotized, narco narcotized, I don't know, like narcoticized <laughs> tranquility that is in the faces of Eastern idols. She's just sort of like lounging in bedroom comfort, having not a care in the world for her new child. Mm -hmm. She's like the child sort of Placements like um like Rainy one, like yeah. where she kind of runs away with this like cool dude, and she's like trying to have like a lot of fun, and she's just there for like um uh, like kind of a sexual thrill of it, and you think she's like really trying to kind of rationalize it into like oh well he's actually really cool. I feel like she's not the reason why she can't eat him because he's like talking about how he gets like that arrogant. Mm. And like I feel like if we did work on people, you know, she she sees something different than what observers see of Blanche. Blanche sees it as like it doesn't matter if he's popular or good looking, like he's a bad person, but she just sees what she wants to see. Thank you. 
talk so much about how the women refer to the men as animals like goats and pigs and uh cavemen and so on and beasts um and lambs even um but she does keep saying like people do this like people behave this way this is something that happens when people get together and there's that normalizing function to it but i also like the way that um she's kind of celebrating like She's trying, and I think Ali Rose is right about the play saying it's not the right way to do it, but she's trying to like celebrate humanity in the way that New Orleans kind of does celebrate humanity. Like you listen, you read on the page, there's music constantly playing and, and they can always hear the music as it's like sort of permeating into their apartment, right? And it's the cell of like music itself is like the celebration of human achievement and jazz is a celebration of like, humans variability and uh, creativity especially right um so, so she might be coming from this place like bell reeves which is like all white pillars and sort of boring manners and chivalry and so on um and she comes into this place like new orleans and she's just like it's exciting that he is a human being in this place that he doesn't have to um live up to all these restrictions of society but what she doesn't seem to understand is that stanley is and I don't think Stanley understands this either, like he's living in his own kind of restricted society. Um, it's, it has its own set of rules to follow, um, but she sees it as something very free and uh, exciting that way, thrilling, right? I think the, um, the fact that Stanley is always coming back to her after like this episode of like rage and just like begging for her forgiveness, it gives her it's manipulative on his part because it gives her a sense of control like um as if she's in charge of like i guess it's up to her whether um, she stays with sam or not like um yeah keep instead of saying like i'm sorry i'll be i'll be better um that's what i'm trying to say but like instead of um like he's Trying to make her feel like she has more control than she has, and that she, yeah, that she could get out anytime she wanted to, and that he's genuinely trying to be better, and she is giving him permission to try. And Jaden, I think, was saying something similar. It's this ironic, her like egging on Stanley and doing things that she knows he's gonna, she knows he's gonna hate. Is like this ironic form of control then too. So it's both the control of making him act out this way and the control then of being able to forgive him if she wishes that she has that choice. Next time we gotta talk about the Stella theme, where he's like, Stella. It's it's a little bit of an awkward thing to talk about in high school, but we can talk about it. It's important. All right, let's uh, let's clean up. You guys did very good. I took lots of notes, lots of interesting insights here. Yes. Do you think Stanley's like actually in love with Stella, or is he in love with love? Mirror. I don't know. I don't know if in that system, if you're capable of real love, in the way I'd like to think of love. He has the hot for sure. <laughs> is that a phrase people still say? <laughs> okay. Yeah. 